Who who does not like to read? I think a lot a lot of us do not like to read. Who remembers the Scholastic Book Fair in elementary school? Oh yeah, Scholastic Book Fair. There's some memes like I've spent my whole adult life seeking the high of the Scholastic Book Fair or Second grade me walking into the Scholastic Book Fair with a crisp 10, burning a hole in my pocket. Or me convincing my mom I need that crime scene investigation kit from the Book Fair catalog. The Scholastic Book Fair describes itself as a magical, unforgettable experience where all kids can become readers. You're excited to buy that Captain Underpants book, the Boxcar Children, the newest Guinness Book of World Records, Goosebumps Clifford, Magic School Bus, the Scholastic Book Fair made reading fun, but if we're honest, reading is not that fun. It had to be made fun for a lot of us. And if you're a Christian, if you go to church, we hear very often, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible, pray every day, read your Bible. But it's really hard to read your Bible. It's hard to read anything for a lot of us. As a little kid, it was much easier for our babysitter or our parents to read us a book out loud to us, because that's like their job, yeah? And as a Christian, it's a lot easier to come here once a week and have me read the Bible to you, because that's my job. But it's important for all of us to read our Bibles every day, because the Word of God has the power to transform your life every time you open your Bible. But we all recognize it's very hard to get started, and it's very hard to actually do. So at the gathering right now, we are in a five-week sermon series that we're calling Start Small. And we're going through every Sunday for five Sundays, the top five smallest books in the Bible so you guys can get started and to give you confidence that you can read all the rest. So last Sunday, we went through Third John, which is the smallest book in the entire Bible. Today, we're going through... Second John, which is the second smallest book in the entire Bible. So you guys can open up your Bibles to Second John. So the last book of the Bible is Revelation. This is like right before Revelation. It might be easier to go to like the Bible app. You can just go down to Second John it's towards the end. And we're going to uh, listen to the audio book version of it. It's about two minutes long because it's a lot easier to listen. So this book is only um, 245 words. It is one chapter, 13 verses. So as we look at the book of Second John, I'll be, I'll be, uh, we're doing like the New Living Translation today, and let's listen to the book of Second John. The book of Second John. Greetings. This letter is from John the Elder. I am writing to the chosen lady and to her children, whom I love in the truth, as does everyone else who knows the truth, because the truth lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace, which come from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, will continue to be with us who live in truth and love. Live in the truth. How happy I was to meet some of your children and find them living according to the truth, just as the Father commanded. I am writing to remind you, dear friends, that we should love one another. This is not a new commandment, but one we have had from the beginning. Love means doing what God has commanded us, and He has commanded us to love one another, just as you heard from the beginning. I say this because many deceivers have gone out into the world. They deny that Jesus Christ came in a real body. Such a person is a deceiver and an antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked so hard to achieve. Be diligent so that you receive your full reward. Anyone who wanders away from this teaching has no relationship with God. But anyone who remains in the teaching of Christ has a relationship with both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to your meeting and does not teach the truth about Christ, don't invite that person into your home or give any kind of encouragement. Anyone who encourages such people becomes a partner in their evil work. Conclusion. I have much more to say to you. I don't want to do it with paper and ink, for I hope to visit you soon and talk with you face to face. Then our joy will be complete. Greetings from the children of your 
sister chosen by God. Dear Jesus, thank you for your holy word that's powerful. Thank you for speaking to us right now. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to transform us. God, we ask that you somehow speak through me. Amen. This book is actually a letter written by the elder. The elder is the disciple John, and according to verse 1, he is writing this letter to the chosen lady and her children. So who in the world is the chosen lady? What does the Bible to speak about the chosen lady? It is most commonly thought that this is referring to one of the churches that the disciple John was overseeing because he was spiritually mentoring and overseeing many churches in the area. And churches are often called her in the Bible. And as the church, the church is the bride of Christ. So this is referring to a chosen lady, which is a church. And the children are the people of that church. In verse 13, John says, Greetings from the children of your sister, chosen by God. Basically meaning, the people at my church, say hi to the people at your church. Their churches are sisters. Verse 12, John is saying that he's really excited to go visit the other church soon and has a lot more to say. But even though he was going to visit this other church soon, he thought it was very important that this letter be sent right now to them. This letter could not wait any longer. They had to hear this message. So why is the message in this letter so important? Why is it in the Bible? And how does it apply to our life today? I'm going to focus on three quick reasons why John wrote this letter and why it matters to us. The first main reason that John wrote this letter that we call the book of Second John is that truth is our last name. Truth is our last name. So my mom's maiden name was Bo. So when she grew up, everyone just called her Lisa Bo, Lisa Bo, Lisa Bo, stubbed her toe, where'd she go? I don't know, Lisa Bo. Lisa Bo was her name. And we know people, like, we know people in our lives that we call by their first and their last name together. You know, you might think of some people, John German, Michael Dunn. Or maybe if, you're, if your name is like one syllable, one syllable, Matt Hayes, Lane Pell, Mike Camp. Their first name and their, and their last name are a part of their identity. And as Christians, for us, what John is saying here is that truth is our last name. Rudy Truth, Bethany Truth, Lane Truth. Truth is your last name name. What does that mean? So in this letter, in the first four verses, John says the word truth five times. That's a big ratio right there. So why does he do it? So in uh, verses one through four, he says, I am writing to the chosen lady and to her children whom I love in the truth, as does everyone else who knows the truth, because the truth lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace, which come from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, will continue to be with us who live in truth and love. How happy I was to meet some of your children and find them living according to the truth, just as the Father commanded. What is truth? In other parts of the Bible, in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am truth. In John 16, 13, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. In Titus 1, 2, it says God cannot lie. John 17, 17 says God's word is truth. So the entire Bible is telling us God is truth. Our identity is in God. God is the definition of truth. He defines what is true and what is a lie in our world. So in 2 John 1 through 4, when it's talking about truth, it's referring to truth as something we know, something that lives in us, something that lives through us, and it's a way that we love others. So in John's greeting in this letter, verses 1 through 4, in this greeting, he is saying that because we all know the truth and have accepted Jesus as our Savior, 
Because of that, we can love one another. We are in Ohana, a spiritual family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. You might have heard that cliche Christianese phrase before, but it's true. We are a spiritual family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, and God is our Father. And that brings us to our second point, that love is the glue that holds us together. Love is the glue that holds us together. Okay, glue stick or glue bottle? Glue stick? Glue stick? Glue bottle? Glue stick? Glue bottle? Personally, I prefer glue stick. Glue stick all the way here. Today I have a glue bottle. It's actually Neosporin. Um, but I also have some, uh, I got some staples and I got some tape. So, got some paper too. If you hold some paper together, it's just going to fall apart, right? If you put two pieces of paper close to each other, they're just going to fall apart. You need an adhesive. So, you need staples. You need some tape. And some Neosporin. An adhesive is the glue that holds us together. And these verses are saying that love is the adhesive. And adhering to God's word is what holds us together. When we stick to God's word, we stick together. When we stick to God's word, we stick together. Adhering is the adhesive because things naturally fall apart. My high school band fell apart. Band-aids fall off. Relationships fall apart. You have to work at them with love to hold them together, right? Just because you're around someone all the time doesn't mean you get along. Sometimes being so close to others makes it worse. Just ask your roommates. Some people are great friends but horrible roommates. As Christians, <laughs> we are a family, and truth is our last name. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're around each other all the time. We see each other on Sundays, in connect groups. We see what each other are doing on social media. We randomly see each other around town. But just because we're living together doesn't mean we love each other. Just because we're living together doesn't mean we love each other. And as Christians, let's not just be roommates, let's be family. Let's not just share the rent, let's share the love. In verse 5, John says, I am writing to remind you, dear friends, that we should love one another. How do we love one another? Verse 6, it says, love means doing what God has commanded us to do. So when we do what God has commanded us to do, we are loving one another. Adhering to God's word is the adhesive that holds us together. And one of the commandments God gives us is to love one another. Verse 5 and 6, John says, this is nothing new. I gave this to you at the beginning. This is the great commandment that Jesus said earlier in the book of Matthew. In Matthew 27, 37 through 40, Jesus says this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law... And all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Loving Jesus, loving others. The mission statement of our church and the purpose of every Christian's life. And as Mackenzie said, there are so many different ways that we can love Jesus and love one another. And Jesus says all those commands, all the advice, all the wisdom and truth in the entire Bible. There's 66 books books in the one book. Huge book. Everything can be summarized by loving Jesus, loving others. Four simple words. And when we love Jesus, we are loving others. When we love others, we are loving Jesus. It naturally goes hand in hand. So when we live a life following God, when we obey his commandments, when we adhere to his word, personally, we are loving everybody around us in our lives. As Christians, as the gathering, let's not 
Just be content with being around each other. Let's love one another. Let's go out of our way to be vulnerable, to be real with each other, to be uncomfortable, to give comfort to others because we are a family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ and love is the glue that holds us together. And that brings us to our third point. We must protect the family. We must protect the family. No one gets left behind. In verse 7 through 9, John says, I say this because many deceivers have gone out into the world. They deny that Jesus Christ came in a real body. Such a person is a deceiver and an antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked so hard to achieve. Be diligent so that you receive your full reward. Anyone who wanders away from this teaching has no relationship with God. But anyone who remains in the teaching of Christ has a relationship with both the Father and the Son. So the background, the context, what was happening here when John wrote this letter is some people had previously been a part of this church, but they left and then they came back again and they ended up being able to teach in this church and they were teaching lies about Jesus. And John is saying those people are deceivers. Anyone who claims to be a Christian but denies the fundamental teachings about Christ is a false prophet. Like Jesus is fully man and fully God. If someone denies that, they're an antichrist, according to verse 7. And the Bible speaks about the antichrist in the end times in the book of Revelation. The Bible also speaks about antichrists, which are deceivers, false prophets, people that call themselves Christians but don't preach Christ. They claim to be Christians, but they came to deceive, and they are still doing this today. So in verse 8 and verse 9, John is saying we must protect the family from false teaching because when we are deceived, we may end up no longer believing. And we must know the truth because if you don't know the truth, you won't know the lies. And if we listen to false teachers, we can start believing what they say instead and not even realizing our relationship with God is gone. We must protect the family. That's what these verses are saying. We must protect the family from false teaching. And then in verse 10 and 11, John continues, and he's sharing about a specific situation and how to protect the family. He says, If anyone comes to your meeting and does not teach the truth about Christ, don't invite that person into your home or give any kind of encouragement. Anyone who encourages such people becomes a partner in their evil work. But aren't we supposed to love everybody, no matter what? Yeah, but John is saying in this specific situation that if someone comes to your gathering, like all you guys came today, or someone walks up and comes to your gathering, or someone joins our church and starts teaching lies, false things about Jesus, these verses are saying don't encourage them. Don't clap for that. Don't invite them into their house and take them out to eat. Because if you do, you become a partner in what they are doing. John is saying protect the family by not partnering with false teachers. So last Sunday, when we looked at 3 John, we focused on how other Christians and other churches are not competitors, they are partners. And today in the book of 2 John, John is saying if someone is claiming to be a Christian, but they are teaching lies about Jesus, don't partner with them. Don't encourage them. Because if you do, you'll be endorsing their message. So that's why as Christians, we do not partner with Mormons or Jehovah Witness, because they call themselves Christians, but they don't preach Christ. You love the family by protecting the family from false teachers. And like a very practical example, uh, if you've been a part of the gathering for a while, or at least six months, uh, you know how the first five years of our church, we had an open share time, we had an open mic time, for 10 minutes every Sunday. 
where anyone could come up and share. And we, sti we still do this for our last Friday night monthly worship and testimony nights. And it's really cool how the Holy Spirit moves and connects the dots and people share amazing things. It's awesome. And last Friday nights are still awesome. But, but occasionally some person will come up front and just say something totally whack that's obviously false teaching, obviously not loving others, and obviously supporting some personal agenda they wanted to share with everybody. Our church open share time became a platform for whatever people wanted to talk about. Like for example, one time said, when this one dude came up here and said, we are all God. <laughs> so, so if I came up and then we all clapped for him and I was like, dude, thanks for sharing, man. That's awesome. Who wants to share next? Dude, if I do not correct that message, I am endorsing that message. I'm also partnering and proclaiming that message. So that's why at the gatherings now on Sundays, we ask people ahead of time that we trust. And they have time to prepare what God is going to share through them. And we still have an open share time, open mic, at last Friday night. And it is really cool, but I'm not afraid to cut people off. <laughs> if you say nothing sometimes, or if you just, you, you, can, you can endorse and partner with others very easily. False teaching has to be corrected right away. And as church leaders... We protect the family from false teachers. We interview and have an application for people that want to be church leaders and want to lead connect groups. We are selective on who we let give sermons on Sundays and who is allowed to speak on behalf of the church. And as Christians, we can all protect each other. If, you go, if you're a part of the gathering, if you go to a different church, we're all a part of the same spiritual family, and we all need to protect each other by knowing the truth. So we'll know the lies by reading our Bibles, by spending time with God and each other as iron sharpens iron, and as we love each other, we are protecting each other. So in conclusion, that's what the book of Second John is all about. Reading our Bibles is powerful and transforming and actually way more fun than Scholastic Book Fair. <laughs> Truth is our last name. We are an Ohana, a spiritual family. We are brothers and sisters. Let's not just share the rent. Let's share the love. Adhering to God's word is the adhesive that holds us together. When we stick to God's word, we stick together. Love is the glue that we need to do so that we do not fall apart. And let's protect the family. No one gets left behind. Because when we're deceived, we may no longer believe. And we must correct false teachers so we do not give in and endorse their message. So according to what God is saying through the book of Second John, that is how we love one another. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this simple gospel message that gives us a purpose to our life. God, there's so many ways to love you and to love others. God, I pray you'd free us from this pressure to find a certain plan, like Mackenzie was saying. God, we know you give us freedom to love you. God, we pray you'd protect this family, that we give us a love for each other, even if we find each other difficult sometimes. God, I pray you'd fill our love, fill our hearts with love instead of hate towards people here and towards everyone in our world. God, I pray you'd give us a love for your word like, like Rebecca loves reading books, God. God, we just pray you'd give us hunger, a thirst to read your book, your word more, God, because there's the power to transform and change our life every single time we open it up. God, I pray we, we can't do this on our own. We surrender. We just we give our lives we give our own personal agendas. We give it all to you, God. We pray for protection. We pray for love. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.